What's up everybody, welcome to another video and I hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. It's Friday and it's been one of those weeks where I'm super glad it's Friday, I'm ready to just chill, relax a little bit. And I thought what better way to do that than to prove some stuff. So we're gonna do some proofs in this video. Actually, I'm gonna take you through proving this limit law and I thought maybe this could be a fun series I could do where I could go through and prove each of the limit laws. Let me know if that's something you'd be interested in. But the reason I like these proofs are because they're a little bit fun. I, th I really like just delta epsilon in general type proofs. I just, I think they're fun. So they're fun, first of all, but also they're very beginner friendly. All you really need to have is an understanding of delta and epsilon, basically the definition of a limit, right? If you understand that definition, then you're good to go. You should be able to prove this and all the other limit laws, really. If you don't understand that definition, well, you're in luck because I have a pretty decent video, right? Talking about delta epsilon definition of a limit. So click right up there, I'll put that link, then you can come back to this video, pull out a pencil and paper and prove this by yourself maybe okay but you should at least try and that's what I encourage you to do in this video and really in all my videos that involve proofs is to pause the video think about it make some notes do what you got to do right construct your own understanding of this kind of stuff because you can watch my videos all day and still really not learn anything if you're not thinking right that's the point of these videos is to give a little clarity give a little perspective so you can pause and you can go sit down and think about it that's how you really learn math is thinking constructing your own understanding so let's go ahead and start let f be a function such that the limit of f of x as x approaches a equals l okay prove that for each real number k so any real number the limit of f of x times k as x approaches a equals k times l so this should be pretty intuitive right if I have the limit let me, let's maybe do an example actually if I have the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared equals 4 then the limit as x approaches 2 of 4 x squared equals 16 and so on this will work for any real number k and for any function such that this is true right should be pretty intuitive where's my eraser Let's go and erase now that we've seen an example. By the way, examples have been shown to be really good for understanding proofs. They're not, I mean, you can't use them to prove things, but they're really good. Always try examples, draw pictures, do all that stuff. It really helps me to understand and to prove things even, okay? So prove that for each real number. So since I see this for each, sometimes we see for all, right? That's really what that means, for all k in the real number. So the first thing I need to do in my proof is let k be a real number, right? Let k, we have to keep k as arbitrary, okay? <laughs> that was bad, I'm sorry. Okay, so k is a real number. The first thing that jumps out at me though is, what if k is zero? I think when k is zero, this is already done for us, right? Zero times anything is zero. So then we have the limit of zero, the limit of zero, which the limit of zero as x approaches anything is zero, right? And that, so that lines up when k is zero, we're good there need to keep my eraser handy okay so when k equals zero we know that this is true so we can just suppose let k be a real number such that k is not zero right I think this will make our life a little easier in the future and maybe you'll see why once we get to the end of the proof okay so let's see k is not zero where can we go from here let epsilon be greater than zero now we're pulling the definition out of our pocket right and in general a really good tip I think for proving anything is look at kind of the vocabulary words and the definitions of things you've been given and write out those definitions and see how you can manipulate them. That's half of a delta epsilon proof, it's just using the definition. Let epsilon be greater than zero, then there exists. Where is there this exists coming from? Where is this definition coming from? Well, the fact that we know the limit of f of x as x approaches a equals l, right? That means that given any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that if if what? If zero is less than the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, then, then what? Well, then f of x minus l is less than epsilon, duh, right? That's our definition. So here's the thing about delta epsilon proofs just in general, is they're always done in reverse. We do the proof in reverse, and then we erase it all, and when we actually write out the formal proof, we unreverse it, and then we throw it in a textbook and we act as if you're supposed to know how to do that all along, as if it was like trivial and easy to get that result when we have erased all the scratch work that completed the proof. Does that make sense? That's why delta epsilon proofs are a nightmare to read from textbooks. They're just, yeah, that's why. So let epsilon be greater than zero, there exists a delta such that if this, then this. So what am I trying to show? What am I trying to show? 
I'm trying to show that this limit equals k times L. So what I'm really trying to show is I'm trying to get to something like this. F of x uh, times k, right? k times f of x minus kl is less than epsilon. Hopefully y'all can see that. That's really what I'm trying to show, right? If I can sh show that for any epsilon there exists a delta such that if zero is less than all that stuff, right, then this is less than epsilon, then I've completed the proof. But how can I get there? Well, it looks kind of similar to what I have here. I think I can manipulate it. And this is the reverse part of the proof I'm talking about. I'm starting with what I want to show and this is how we do it when we prove just a limit exists as well using the definition. I start with what I'm trying to show, I manipulate it to look like what I have assumed, right? And then I can change my epsilon. We're gonna see how it works in a second, right? Well, this, let's erase and go back to here. This is equal to what? I'm gonna factor out the K because this is looking more and more like what I have here, right? I have the f of x minus l, and now I can actually separate this because the absolute value of k I can take out. Hopefully, y'all can see over here. Okay, now separating this, what can I do? Well, f of x minus l is less than epsilon over the absolute value of k. So why have I wrote this? Why have I divided where this epsilon come from? I'm confused, all that stuff, right? Why did I do this? Well, what I know is that I can say that then f of x minus l is less than epsilon for any epsilon. So that means I can, I can assume this is epsilon over two. Sometimes we use epsilon over two. We're gonna see that in the next limit law if I ever get there. Sometimes I can do, I can even do two epsilon, right? I can do whatever I want with epsilon in it. So what is keeping me from doing epsilon over absolute value of k? Right? What is keeping me from, I mean, this limit exists, so I can say for any epsilon, there exists a delta such that if this is true, then this is true. I can say that, right? There's nothing keeping me from doing that. And what's cool is the only thing that would keep you from doing that is if k was zero, bam, we already took care of zero, right? So now you see why I did that. And maybe you wouldn't have noticed that, and you would have gotten here and said, well, wait, what if k is zero? And you would have done a separate case then later on. That would work fine too. I mean, as long as you understand that, right? So this is all a reverse work that we would erase and not put in a textbook and not put in our explanation. But that was the bulk of the proof because that's how we found like the form of our delta, right? Not our delta, our epsilon, the other Greek letter, okay? So now that we've gotten to this, what can we do? Well, let's see, da -da -da, da -da -da, then, mm -hmm, okay. So then what? Well, then we go back, we unreverse it, right? We unpack it, I had to think about where I was for a second. We unreverse it. So then what happens when we multiply both sides by the absolute value of k, and then we can combine the k inside, right? You're gonna see how this works. Then absolute value of k Right, so we just multiply both sides by absolute value of k. So it came down to really just figuring out the form of this epsilon and being the fact that we were able to assume this. Then absolute value of, I'm just gonna go ahead and do kind of two steps in one, okay? Because this is gonna finish the proof. But technically what I would do is probably do two steps. I would first combine them, but keep this outside and this in parentheses, and then I would distribute them in two different steps. So what we've shown here is that given any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta such that if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, then the absolute value of k times f of x is less than k times l. All of that is, I'm sorry, minus k times l is less than epsilon. All of that is true, right? So then we complete the proof, that's it. Thus, the limit of k times f of x as x approaches a equals k times l. So hopefully that makes sense. And if you like this video, then like the damn video. Let me know in the comments below. If you hate it, then let me know too. I'll never do it again. But most importantly, keep flexing those brain muscles. Have a great weekend. Do a bunch of proofs. That's it. See y'all later.